Shalom Harim. I'm Stephen Benjamin with the New Institute of Biblical Research. And it is a pleasure for you to come to speak with you guys today. And uh, I, I wanted to take and speak with you about the message that we spoke in Slovakia recently over in Košice. Uh, my wife was translating the message. You guys didn't get to hear the entire message, mainly because the place that we were at, we, <clears throat> they'd given us a back room and a restaurant to be able to do the meeting. And uh, unfortunately, as the time went on in the evening there, the next thing that we know, they come in there to the opposite side of the room they'd given us, turned on some music that was rather annoying. And even though they turned it down, it still was messing up our own audio. So we weren't able to share all of that with you. But I want to take and share that message with you uh, today. And it's about Jacob and Esau. And uh, which you may have got to hear part of it. It's easier if you can just do it in one language and not go through an interpreter uh, because then you don't lose your train of thought. And <clears throat> so I'm going to share that with you guys to, uh, this morning. And as well, though, I wanted to share with you a dream I had. And um, I'm not about to try to interpret this dream, but it's something that really has troubled my heart uh, this morning. Uh, I woke up early this morning from this dream and I was in prayer with the Lord about it. And I said, God, I, I don't want to forget the dream, but I didn't have anything to write it down with. And But generally, if you have a spiritual dream, you don't forget it regardless. And sure enough, I did not forget any of the details of it at all. But um, I was in Jerusalem in the dream. And uh, uh, as I was in there, I was going up to, to the mountain of God. And... As I began to go up, <clears throat> there was a Jewish sister there that said to me that she was she was going up to worship the Lord as well. And she said, I'm going to go pray before going up to the mountain of God. And uh, supposedly there was a temple on the, on the mount at that point. Um, and so for me, it was just, a, you know, I just assumed that it was there. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to go myself and I'm going to pray before going up to the house of God. So I go on the mountain of God and there were a mixture of people there. There were Orthodox rabbis there that were praying, and uh, but then there were some Gentiles, people of the nations that were there as well. Um, and so I began to pray. And when I did, the next thing I know, I was I laid down on the ground just like David did when he was praying for his son's life, his first son that was born with Bathsheba, that the Lord God took the life of the child. But I was laying on the ground praying, and there was a rock in front of me, probably about like this. And suddenly, right on that rock, it was like uh, an amber or yellowish light were, three sentences appeared on the rock. and But as I read the sentences, it was like something speaking in my heart. I didn't have to, in other words, I didn't have to read it. As the words appeared, it also was spoken to me as well. And this is what the message said. So there is a man that is defiling my holy mountain. And he is getting drunk on my mountain. That was the second sentence. And you are to remove him from my mountain. And that was the third sentence. And I got up after seeing this rock, just like a fire going across with letters on the rock. And I got up and I began to look for the man. And he wasn't among the Jews, but he was among the Gentiles. And I was looking and everybody seemed to be normal. But I could not find anyone drinking. And so finally, though, I was about to give up because I'm thinking, I, I, don't, I don't know who I'm looking for. And I'm like, Lord, what, what would you want me to do this for? And uh, then there was a man with his back to me. And as he seen me coming, he looked over his shoulder and he turned around. And he had a cup in his hand and he just poured it out on the ground. And he says, I've poured it out. And I said, but it, it doesn't matter. You're defiling God's holy mountain. You will have to leave. He says, but I've poured it out already. Why would I have to leave if I poured it out? I said, because God says you must leave. So you have to leave. And he says, for how long? I said, I don't know for how long. So I made him to leave. 
And then I turned and I started to go up where the temple was. And you have to keep in mind, it's kind of interesting. Mount Zion is like the holy mountain of God. And Mount Moriah, which the mountains are next to each other, is where the temple actually sits. And so I'm going up. But when I get to the temple mount, instead of a temple, it's like a church there. And I'm thinking, why is this here? Um, and I was troubled by it. And then they announce an evangelist that's going to be speaking at the, at the temple. And I, and I knew the name of the person. It's a well-known evangelist. I won't call the name of the person right now. But anyway, I was just kind of bothered by these things. I, of course, I woke up right out after that. And I'm like, what does this mean? I, I, I don't understand. But anyway, I, I just feel uh, that the messages that God is going to lay on my heart to bring forth may be a little different, a little bit stronger maybe even, because uh, I believe we're living in a very late hour. And um, I think it's important that we prepare ourselves and I think really more so the reason why I believe the messages that I'll be bringing to you will be a little bit more different is because I feel pressed in my heart to really be in prayer and really seeking the Lord to know His will and know His mind. And I mean, it's, it's, it's very little to have to say to you what's going on in the world. You guys know, you see it every day, you see it on the news. We know the things that are happening. Uh, but let me just share with you that message there. It is a very, very deep message, and it's much bigger than what you realize. Or at least, let me say, it's, it's bigger than what I realize. <laughs> so, if I can say it like that. Esau and Jacob are a type um, well, they're brothers, naturally. One of the things that I did in the message in Koshitsa is I go into um, how that Esau is, is, is Rome. It's not even so much a type. They, the, 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 the Roman Vatican Church today are the descendants of Esau, and they have intermingled and married amongst the, the Syrian people, which are the Arabic peoples, and it's one of the reasons why we hear of the Vatican creating the religion Islam to begin with is because they are half-brothers, just as they are half-brothers with, with Israel as well. So... Uh, and when I teach this message, please understand, just because a person is a Roman Catholic or just because a person is a Roman by birth uh, doesn't mean that through the blood of Christ that a person cannot come in and be accepted. Sure they can. But Esau's descendants, in this case here, where the Vatican has been made um, in modern days, there is no place of repentance for the Vatican. Uh, God clearly says to the people, both Jew and Gentile alike, he says, come out of her, my people, unless you be partakers of her sins and of her plagues. The plagues would be brought out by the two witnesses. The sins are because her sins have gone up before God. She's killed every prophet, every, every righteous person. She's crucified and murdered. She killed... Uh, she was the one, even though the Jews condemned Jesus to death, it was the Romans that actually crucified him. Uh, they also killed uh, all the saints after him. So when the Bible says the blood of the saints uh, and martyrs are on their hands, it is true. It is upon their hands. And uh, so when we look at the story of Esau and Jacob, it's very interesting. Even the marriage of uh, Jacob's two wives, Rachel and Leah, uh, I, the Lord hasn't fully unraveled this for me as of yet, but uh, even in the preliminary part of it, it appears to me that Rachel represents Israel, whereas, whereas Leah represents the Gentile bride. Uh, I say that because Rachel is barren and is not able to produce children, but Leah is very fruitful and able to produce children. And, uh, and so at this point, and I, and I may be wrong on this, but at this point it seems like that Rachel represents Israel because when Christ comes and she should be pregnant with the word and give forth to children of God, um, Rachel is barren. And it ends up being Leah who produces children uh, for Jacob. And uh, 
But I don't know. I, I have to really pray about this a little bit more. The main thing is, though, is Jacob and Esau, because it is more than just a type and a shadow. It is a realistic genealogical uh, manifestation in modern times. So before I go uh, too deep into the story of Jacob and Esau in their beginning part here, I'm going to take you to Obadiah and establish this so you'll know that. Uh, but let's just first start out to set the stage of the story. We know that with with Jacob and Esau, uh, Jacob's mother, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, she knows that Jacob is a goodly boy. She knows he's a, he's a comely child. He's a very good son and very loyal to his family. And she's the one that encourages him to, when she hears about uh, that Isaac wants to bless Esau, the older child, to take and deceive his brother in order to get the birthright. She wanted, her, she wanted Jacob to get the blessing because she knew he was a more honorable child in doing so. And so she plots this plan out for him. And when he does, and he does deceive his brother in order to get the birthright, um, because of the fear of his life, he has to go into exile because Esau wants to kill him at that point uh, because he is robbed of the birthright. And, and he sold it out for a... As the, as the book of Hebrews brings it out in the New Testament, for a pottage of meat he sold his own birthright out. Uh, it, it wasn't as valuable to him. And, of course, he even marries in amongst the Arabic women there uh, that, his, that his mother hated, didn't want him marrying amongst some women as well, as far as Esau did. Uh, and it just really become a big mess. But Jacob has to flee into exile, and just like Israel goes into exile in 70 AD um, as well. So we see a lot of similarities there. And it is when um, Jacob actually has to come back home to the promised land that he's faced with Esau once again. Ironically, in modern days, it's the same thing with Israel today. The prophecy is there that Israel would return to her homeland. But there's so much talk in the world today that it is the Illuminati, it is the Catholic Church that helped bring the Jews back to their homeland. It really has nothing to do with the Jews. It's not, and people even assume it's nothing to do with God because of the way it happened. Well, that, nothing can be further from the truth because God can always take the evil and, and make it work for his good. Uh, and so therefore, uh, and we have, we have many cases in the Bible, Rehoboam is one of them. Uh, it, it is put in his heart to do evil unto the children of Israel uh, instead of the good that the elders recommended. So he uses the younger man's ideas uh, to do the evil to the children of Israel and literally causes Israel to be split into two nations, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And it looks like, oh my God, why would he do something like that when you're looking at the story? But then we read the biblical account that God put this in his heart to reject the elder's idea or the right way to help keep the country together as one nation because God was going to fulfill his prophecy because he said that the nation would be split in two. So it was the Lord that anointed Rehoboam to make the decision that he did. And so therefore the nation of Israel was split and became two nations. The same thing in modern days. The prophecies that Israel would return to her homeland and would once again become a nation. We see in the, the book of Micah. It's very interesting in the book of Micah because Israel comes back. God is talking about blessing them. And then God says that she would go into a great travail. So he brings her home for redemption, but then puts her into a tremendous travail, which is what we're seeing in Israel right now. Israel is in a tremendous travail today. And, but we're looking at the natural side and we say, well, it was the Rothschilds that helped bring the Jews back. It was uh, the Catholic Church that helped bring them back. And all of that, yes, plays into it. Why? Because in order for God to fulfill his prophecy, he causes different peoples to create a state of Israel to bring the Jews back to their homeland. Now the, now the big issue comes up, there's fighting and, and the Catholic Church is, seems to be getting their way. They're, they've got Mount Zion now. Uh, they have effectively taken the tomb of David away from the, the Orthodox rabbis. They've held communion inside the tomb of David, as well as the upper room above, that is considered to be the upper room. And um, so the Catholic Church is just doing whatever they want. And they have threatened the Jewish rabbis and have told them, unless you 
give us back all of the holy sites that were once ours, then we cannot guarantee the safety of your families. Uh, so this is the way they have come in. What is it? It's the same thing that Esau has always done. When Jacob was trying to return back to the homeland, when God and God tells him, rise up and go back to the land of your fathers, he is afraid of Esau because he's afraid that his brother will kill him because his brother already swore he would kill him. And so this is where we see this in the story about him being fearful. He's going back and stuff. Uh, so let's just, we're going to go into Obadiah in a few minutes here so I can show you how that this is not just a type, but it's a biblical fact. But let me just take, let's first start off in, in Genesis chapter 32 and uh, verse 1. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of this place Mahanim, Mahanim. <clears throat> and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom, and they commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, and saith, Thus have I sojourned with Laban, and stayed here until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants, and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Now, notice he has prospered while he was in exile. So does the Jewish people. The Jewish people have always prospered while they were in exile. Anytime they're given liberty, they're able to prosper. But Laban, and by the way, Laban, his father is a Syrian. So he is a Gentile as well. And Laban changes his wages 10 times. Same thing that happened to the Jewish people. Every time they start to do good, it, something has changed on them. But God is always with them. Even though they're going, the exile is part of their, is, is the punishment for what was done with Christ. Um, it's still, it, it must, and, and by the way, that has to happen. For those that, that don't know that it, maybe it's your first time you've ever heard this, these messages here. Uh, the Bible says if you sow the wind, you reap a whirlwind. And the word sow in Hebrew is to plant. And the word wind is ruach. It's the spirit. Same word for the spirit. So when the Lord revealed that to me is when, when Israel tried to bury the spirit of God because the spirit of God was inside of Christ. He, was, he had that spirit of life in him like the tree in the Garden of Eden. It's Chaim. He was bearing the life of God inside of himself so that the Holy Spirit could be poured out upon us. And so when they tried to bury, that was the Jewish people tried to bury the Spirit of God, planet, then God's law required a judgment for doing so. Now they had to do it because if they didn't do it, then there would be no life to, to, for either for the Jews nor the Gentiles. This is why before Jesus dies, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, Israel, they're not a chosen people because they're better than the Gentiles. We're not better. We're chosen nation unto God because why? We were chosen to offer up the greatest sacrifice that ever would be, and that was Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God. Not only to take away our sins, but as well to give us back that fire of God, that Holy Spirit that was once in Adam and Eve. Remember how John says in the Christian Bible, in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, later it reads on down, the Word was made manifest and dwelt among us. Okay, so that speaks of Christ. But it also says, I think in the fourth verse, that that light was the light of men. You see, in the beginning, and John refers it back, in the beginning, Bereshit, which is what we call the word Genesis, which means at the first, or in the beginning. And it says there's a place in Genesis that says, it's about the second or third verse of Genesis, you know, uh, So the very first time God speaks his own word, because the Bible says in the beginning was the word. So I looked one time to see what was the first word God literally speaks. And his first words was, which means, and he said, Elohim, and he said God, Yahior. Now we translate that, let there be light, but it's greater than let there be light. That word yahi is so hard to translate in English because it is eternity coming into existence to be 
able to fellowship with his creation, which was Adam and Eve. And of course, uh, he had yet to create them, but here light comes into existence, which is the Shekinah glory of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God dwelling. You know, no wonder why the Bible says he brooded on, upon the face of the deep. You know, it's the Spirit of God is brooding on the face of the deep. He's walking on the water. You know, just like when Christ walked on the water. What was it? It was God inside of the Son of God making himself known, the world known to himself. So he's inside this human body. But what does he do when he breathes into the nostrils of Adam? See, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, God's own life. And of course, then he's called Ish. And the woman comes out, she's called Isha, which is literally the fire of Yahweh or the light of God. See, then in other words, they're filled with light. This is why Christ comes and dies and does what he does. And this is why Israel had to offer him up because Adam and Eve had forfeited it. And the only way to get it back was for a second Adam to come. Because you have to remember, if Adam was put into a deep sleep and God opened up his side, and literally Eve is made from two parts. Mean Ish, the Bible says, which is from the fire of God, and mean Adam, from Adam, in other words, God had taken the DNA for the body of hers to be created, and he'd taken from the fire of God the Holy Spirit that was inside of Adam and made the woman, Isha. And their two names have the two, first two divine letters in the name of God, which is Yah, yod Hey. So anyway, they forfeited this, and therefore God in, his, in, in, um, in, re, in the redemption process, this is why you have to be born again, because you're born of flesh. Flesh has no spirit, no life in it as far as the life of God. So the new birth is really not a complicated matter. It's the fact that when you believe upon him, he's able to breathe in your nostrils, the very spirit of almighty God in you. And then you become that living creature of God that is God's life in you, the Eitz uh, Chaim, breathing, Ipach Pa'av, Nishma Chaim. So God has to breathe into your nostrils that breath of life as well. That's why Jesus breathes on his apostles and says, Receive you, Lord, the Holy Ghost. See, he was breathing upon them that life already. Anyway, beautiful story there. But so Jacob, uh, he comes along and we see here that he's, 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 he's prospering while he's in exile. And, uh, and though, but the Gentiles are still not, Laban's not for him. Uh, but he gets a wife with Laban. And, uh, and he actually gets two. He gets Leah and Rachel. And so we read on down, though, in verse 6, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and 400 men with him. And I thought that was fascinating, that 400 men came with, are coming with Esau to meet Jacob. And at the same time, Jacob is trying to buy peace with Esau. That's the same thing Israel's doing today. Shimon Peres says that the only one that can bring peace to the Middle East is the Pope of Rome. He says this about Pope Francis. This is why they actually give the Pope Francis a seat at King David's tomb. They literally give him an official seat at King David's tomb. This is why they allowed him to do the communion service at the upper room. And of course, they have the right with the David's tomb as well. So he goes to David's tomb. Why? To show why. Show that the Pope is sitting on David's throne. It's, that's all symbolic, but that's exactly what he's doing. And who is he? Who is the Pope of Rome? He's Esau. He's one of, he is literally one of Esau's descendants. And I'll, I'm going to take you and prove to you that he would be a, uh, one of Esau's descendants because his parents were born in Italy. They're from Italy. They are Romans. And so therefore, Pope um, Francis is a Roman or uh, a descendant of Esau, literally. All right, now, uh, so he comes down with 400. Uh, he's got 400 men coming with him, which reminds me of Jezebel. Remember Ahab? The king, king Ahab, he took and married Jezebel, who was a Gentile, brought idolatry into Israel. Now, Ahab represents Israel today. Of course, Shimon Perez is like the son of Ahab, because, see, God, God was going to bring judgment upon Ahab for his sins, for bringing Jezebel and bringing idolatry into Israel. But then Ahab repented before the Lord in sackcloth and ashes, and God saw his humility. 
And God says to the prophet uh, Elijah, he says, go back and tell him, thus saith the Lord, I have seen his sincerity and his humbleness, and he's repented before me with tears. He says to tell him, it will not come upon him, but it will come upon his son. And Shimon Perez is the son of Ahab that has brought Jezebel, the Roman Catholic Church, into Israel in modern days to bring idolatry and to bring on all the hills of, of, of Jerusalem here to bring in the high places and the idolatrous temples everywhere. You know, God was pleased with like David and like with Solomon. And he was pleased with Josiah, especially with Josiah. The young king became king at eight years old. But when Josiah heard the laws of God, when it was discovered in the temple, they were cleaning the temple up and repair, doing repairs on the temple. And it came and was read into his ears that God was not pleased with certain things. He takes and tears his clothes and he puts that cloth and ashes on and he weeps before the Lord. And Josiah wants to make a change. And then God has, uh, they go before the Lord and the, the high priest, see, it was funny. The high priest doesn't have the answer for him. They said, we have to seek a prophet. And Huldah, she was a prophet as a woman prophet that was in the land. And they have to, the high priest goes to Huldah to get the answer from God, what is to be done. And who the prophesies unto Josiah good things because of his humbleness of his heart, but he, she says to Israel that God will bring Israel down for bringing in all this idolatrous things. So don't think that women don't have a voice. You men that think that they're just to be silent, you totally pervert the words of Paul. I plan on bringing that out again not too long from now so you'll understand that. You want to see the images. I've had people say, I'd like to see that. In fact, when we were in Koshitsa, a brother there, he says, I'd like to physically see it for myself. I've actually pulled the images up on the internet. You can see some of the ancient manuscripts. And in the margin are the questions being asked Paul. And Paul addresses those. And in that original Greek, he says right there, where he says, he doesn't say, I suffer a woman to keep silent in the church. He says, I suffer not that woman to speak in the church. And it's in a margin, and he's answering the question. Oh, gosh. Anyway, we'll go into that later. Let me stay on track here. So Ahab has brought in Jezebel, the Roman Catholic Church, and it's what Israel has done today. Perez has done that, and he's brought all this idolatry in. But where is the king of Israel? Prime Minister Netanyahu, you were anointed as to be king. Why haven't you brought this down? Fear. Like Jacob, fear. But it's not to say that he might not overcome. Not to say that the Prime Minister Netanyahu might not overcome because somewhere along the way in the midst of the week when the covenant is signed, in the midst of that week, we're going to have a leader in Israel that will rise up and say, it's wrong, it will break that covenant. And then God will come and tear down all of your altars. So anyhow, Jezebel, by the way, had 400 prophets that ate at her table. Hmm. Isn't it interesting how that the different Gentile, uh, or excuse me, Protestant church leaders uh, are coming to the Vatican to eat at her table? They're fed at Jezebel's table, the Vatican's table. Esau had 400 men. And so Jezebel has got 400 of her own prophets that are eating at her table, and Rome today as well is gathering up all these different church, church leaders like Kenneth Copeland being one of those, and uh, Joel Osteen another one, and now I hear another great big evangelist has gone to Rome. What's he doing? He's gathering up his 400 prophets. And what are they doing? They're going to prophesy against Israel. Mm. Don't worry, though. This is why God sends Elijah to deal with the 400 prophets of Jezebel. Or all these evangelists out here that are joining with Rome, God will send the spirit of Elijah and he will condemn every one of these churches that join the Vatican. This ecumenical move will be brought down to ashes.
Verse 8, and said, If Esau come to one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of the, my father Isaac, the Lord which said us unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all mercies and of all the truth that which thou hast showed unto thy servant for the... For with thy staff I passed over the, this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Again, another prophecy. Israel became two nations, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And in the story of Jacob and Esau, we see that already before it even happens, Israel is divided. And he's troubled, just like Israel's troubled today. They're troubled because why? They're threatened by the entire world because the Vatican has control of everybody. And the pressure's on them. So what does Israel do? They send messages to Esau. They're sending gifts to the Roman Catholic Church. They, they bring recently Prime Minister Netanyahu. You bring to him a nice silver menorah. Here's your gift, can I find favor with you, Mr. Pope? At the same time, I believe you're praying and asking God, God, what do we do? You promised us. You even read it yourself, Mr. Netanyahu. You read it at the, at the, at the United Nations that Israel was come home never to be uprooted again. And you know this just as Jacob knows it. But something is wrong. Esau has got a threat on you with his 400 prophets of all these nations, of these evangelists that are controlling the politics in their nations. And they're coming down to make war with you. And you're frightened. Remember, Jacob wrestled all night with God. And it was God. We say an angel. The angel is just the form that God had taken on. Had to have been, because Jacob says, now I've seen God face to face. So he calls the place Peel. I've seen God face to face. Pe is like the mouth or the face of God. El, Peel. And he refused to tell him his name. I believe he was wrestling with Christ. That's why I wouldn't tell him his name because it was not to be revealed yet. That's just a thought. I can't say it, but let's see. Anyway, verse 11, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. Why does he name only one mother? Do you not realize that this is a prophecy? The mother represented Mary who would bring forth the man-child Christ. And the children represent not just Christ, but it represented Israel as well. Because in Revelation you read that he was wroth with the woman in her seed and he went after to make war with her. Which were the, were the remnant of Jews of today. And Esau has always tried to kill the children of Israel didn't say mothers said mother and of course what did Herod do Herod was a Roman a descendant of Esau now to prove to you that that is true when David was killing the descendants of Esau at Mount Seir one child of the royal house of Esau escaped Hadad and his servants which were also Edomites and they go to Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh raises Hadad up in his house, just like he did Moses. Isn't it interesting? Doesn't he just like Moses? Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh as well. But when Moses recognizes his people, he goes out and becomes one of them. Like Christ. See, Moses was a type of Christ. Christ, see, God had compassion on his people. So he takes and makes his own self a son. He begot the son and then God himself gets inside of that human body called Jesus and makes himself known to his own people and becomes one of them. So did Moses. But not Hadad. No, not Hadad. Esau's descendant, he was too proud and too lofty. 
when he becomes a man. He's a little child when he goes to Pharaoh, raised up in Pharaoh's own house. And Pharaoh says, what have you lacked? I've given you everything. He said, this is true. I've not liked anything. He said, but I want to go to my people. Where does he go? Syria. Sure. He saw married amongst the Syrians. So he goes up into Syria. And the Bible says he becomes the king of Syria. And then according to the Jewish record, the historical record, they migrated, the, his descendants migrate open to northern Africa and Italy. No wonder why the Catholic Church, when they were formed, they had monks in northern Africa. No wonder why the Vatican was Constantine. Constantine is nothing but a descendant of Esau. And what did Esau do? He, or his, uh, he married in amongst the Gentile, or the, yeah, the Gentiles there, the Arabic people. So when he wanted to create a diversion, they create Islam as a religion to put it all, everything off on the, on the uh, Arabic people to make it look like they're the bad guys, just like they're doing today. The first caliphate ever created was created by Rome. The caliphate being created today, created again by Rome, another diversion to make the world think, oh, we're going to have an antichrist. It's going to be a Muslim. I'm sure they will create an antichrist out of it to make it look good. But that true Antichrist that has control of the entire world is sitting in the Vatican in Rome and too blind to see it. He sits in the temple of God, worshipped as if he were God, exalting himself above all that is called God. We got to wake up. So he tries to kill the mother with the children. That's what Jacob said. He'll try to smite him. Smite him. And he did. He went after Jesus. Kill all the children two years old and down. See? Try. But he wasn't successful. And thou saidest, I will surely do these good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there and that same night and took uh, uh, that which came to his hand, a present for Esau, his brother, 200 she goats and 20 he goats and 200 ewes of lambs, 20 rams, 30 mitch camels. And see, he begins to name all this stuff and he sends it in droves, one offering and another offering and another offering. But he can't appease Esau with these offerings. Israel's done the same in modern times. Okay, you want, I'm sorry, Mr. Vatican, Mr. Pope, you want us to rip up the, uh, you know, because you love the Palestinians. These are your brothers over here, the Palestinians. We know that they're your brothers and you love them. And you come up strong with a small people, according to Daniel in chapter 11, Daniel, you come up strong with a small people and you have. And you want us to do what? Rip up the Jewish settlements, the land that God has given us. I'll rip the Jews out of there. I give them to you as an offering. Oh, you want us to rip up the Jews out of the West Bank? I'll rip them up and give them to you as an offering. And the politicians of Israel, Ariel Sharon, Benjamin Netanyahu, they keep giving offerings unto Esau. And it's never enough. And what did Esau say when he comes down? So to save time, I'll just tell you. When he finally meets Jacob, of course, Jacob does overcome. He says, I already have enough. Of course, the Vatican has the wealth of the world. They don't need anything. But Jacob persuades him, keep it as a gift of my hand. He says, because, let me read this part to you. It's very interesting. After he, he, now he does wrestle through with God finally and, and overcomes. Then in chapter 33, Verse 9, and Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present in my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. The face of God. Now, he didn't say it was the face of God, but it was like the face of God. Do not forget that the Bible says or excuse me, that the Pope is called a vicar of Christ. He is, an antichrist is, the word antichristo means a type, or in other words, he is like Christ. He is similar to that of Christ. And the Pope of Rome sits on the seat claiming to be God on earth, 
Where did he get the doctrine from to begin with? Hadad was raised in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh was God on earth. Why do you think the Vatican doctrine is the way it is? Why do you think they have sun god worship? And the critic that criticized me when I posted that, that disc that's there in the Holy Sepulchre, right there in the old city of Israel, with the sun disc there and the all-seeing eye there that they put in there, it looks like a picture in there, it says that it's done with, with Photoshop. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go back into Jerusalem. You know, I'm a few hours from there. I'm, I can't be there constantly. It's, you know, it's like being up in the goal on there. You know, you got to drive down and take the time to do it. But I'm going to do it by video. Unless somebody else is kind enough to take the picture while you're in Jerusalem, if you're there right now, take that picture there. Right there where you go into the, what they call the, the tomb of Jesus there. If you just turn opposite of that main entry and go right straight back, they have like four little church sanctuaries around the, the little tomb there. Uh, you just go right into there, and right there above it is a huge sun disk with the all-seeing eye. Also, not only there, I have another one, and I'm going to post that one for you as soon as I get a chance, get everything, because everything's all packed up right now as far as our suitcases and stuff. And I'll get out there because at Mount Tabor, where the two went, where Moses and Elijah comes down and meets Jesus, there's a big Catholic church built up there, and again, a sun disk in there with the all-seeing eye. And I think on that one, if I remember right, it doesn't look like a photo image. It's actually engraved into it, so you can't say Photoshop did it. But nonetheless, if I do it by video, I'll make it really hard for you to figure out that it's a Photoshop thing there because it's a lie for even to suggest it. But I realize that, yes, maybe it does look that way, but it is not. There are thousands of people every, there, every day there. Ask them. Ask them. Have the testimony. See for yourself. And, uh, in fact, uh, Brother... Um, uh, John, John, John Costick, I don't know if you've been in there, Brother John, but if you've been there, Brother John, and if you've taken that picture, or if you've just seen it, let the people know. It's true. I don't know if Brother John even went into the Holy Sepulchre there, but it's true. It's actually there. Now, let's go real quick there. I want to take you to Obadiah, though. Let's just, I want to establish for you. By the way, Chadad, those of you that might want to know where Chadad is, it's in 1 Kings chapter 11. You can read about Chadad there, uh, where he's a descendant of uh, Esau there. Uh, but in Obadiah, this is where we find out for a fact that Esau's descendants are the Romans. You don't even, I mean, I've already proved to you, Hadad, he was the Esau's descendant. But then God proves to you. We don't even need the Jewish account. Everything is written in your Bible. Everything. And yes, there are missing books of the Bible. Some people asked me that not long ago. And I was actually reading somewhere over in, I think it was in the book of Chronicles. And it mentions the book of Nathan and the book of Gad. And said that all the rest of the works that was done by the king was, are, are they not written also? And he names the book of Nathan and the book of Gad. I would love to know how accurate of a works we have. There are many books of the Bible that are mentioned in the Bible that we have itself that we do not have. Uh, like they say, there's references to the book of uh, Enoch. Um, I don't know how accurate what we have today to be the actual book of Enoch, but I do know that the Bible specifically speaks of the book of Nathan and the book of Gad. And I would love to find out what historical documentation we have of the accuracy of these two books. Anyway, uh, Obadiah, let's go right here. Uh, I will take you to verse 6. It's only one chapter, so it's chapter 1, verse 6. How are these things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Now, God immediately begins to show you that Esau is still in existence and they're hidden. They're hidden. It's hidden in the Roman church today. So he's going to show you how they're sought up. He's going to prove to you who they are. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were uh, at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. That They that eat thy bread have laid the wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. In other words, there's no understanding in Esau whatsoever. Uh, his friend of, friends of his confederacy, which he had always con, uh, made confederacies with the Arabic people, which exactly what the Roman Catholic Church does today, uh, as well as the ecumenical move with all the Protestant uh, prophets coming in as well. He says, shall, shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Adam and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? So there is no understanding there. All right, so all you're doing is what you hear them say. And by the way, Jezebel's prophets prophesied one mind and one accord. Why? Because they were fed at Jezebel's table. And this is why you see the Kenneth Copeland prophets of today and all these other evangelical prophets coming in saying the same thing that Rome says because they're going to prophesy one heart, one mind, one accord. Oh, God, it's so perfect with Scripture. How can anybody miss it? And thy 
mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one uh, of the mouth of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. God's going to kill them all. Okay? But it's not been done yet. Let's go to see what he does here. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. Thou shalt be cut off forever. Esau himself did not do violence against Jacob. Everything is prophetic. When God says, I love Jacob and I hated Esau, it wasn't literally Esau as Esau and his descendants. And we can prove this, just like here, the violence against Jacob. Esau didn't come down to do any harm to Jacob. But after, after Esau, every descendant of Esau was against Israel. When Moses tried to come into the promised land with the children of Israel, they were, Esau was there to stop him. His descendants were there to stop him. When the Jews have tried to return in the modern days and everything, Roman Catholic Church, descendants of Esau, they've tried to hinder their way the entire time. When Jesus was here, the Romans, Esau's descendants, mingled in amongst what? Because he showed you they're already confederate with other peoples there along with all the Arab nations of the world against the Jews again, trying to hinder the way of Jacob, always trying to hinder Jacob's way. And that day thou stoodest on the other side, and that day the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Esau's descendants was as one of them. Foreigners. See, scholars today say that it wasn't the Romans that come and ransack the temple and, and all that. This was the Syrians. Hello, do you all forget that Hadad was the king of Syria? Do you not realize that Rome has always had an alliance with Syria? Yes, the eastern and western le leg of the Roman Empire at that time or the Babylonian Empire. Sure, absolutely. They, the Bible, God is saying here, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. So in other words, Rome was in agreement to what was being done to the Jews. So yes, it is true. I would have to agree. People like uh, Chuck Missler that says it was the eastern side of the leg that come and did the dirty work. Sure. God indicts Rome as being one with them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day that thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, 70 AD. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, 70 AD. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress, 70 AD. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, they shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Titus, the Roman general, took the temple treasures, including the menorah, back to Rome. And that's why you have the Ark of Titus in Rome right there. Clarifying! And the Catholic Church says it was showing that the light of God was turned from Jew to Gentile. And they rejoiced! at that day. And that is a historical fact. So now God is showing you who Esau is. Remember, this is all about Esau. Got it? Because he accuses Esau of carrying away the substance. And it was the Roman general Titus that did that, not the Syrians. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those in that did escape, and neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. And Titus was ordering to have every way cut off. Don't let any Jew escape. Down at uh, Masada, and down there in the Dead Sea area, remember when they built that huge ramp up there? He didn't want nobody to, to escape. And God is speaking to exactly what he did. In other words, he said you should let them escape, but they didn't do it. He accuses the Romans, Esau's descendants of that. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as the uh, nations, in other words, all the nations, as thou hast done. And it shall be done unto thee, thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Because you have to remember, Rome was confederate. They controlled all the nations of the world. And America and all the nations, Canada and all these other nations, these are just descendants from this Rome, Babylonian empire that has spread throughout the world. And this is why all the world comes against Israel today. See, so God says, I'm going to return that reward upon your own head. 
For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain. Yeah, the Pope of Rome, they did communion now on the holy mountain of God. So shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. That's pretty serious. But upon my Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Wow. There shall be deliverance. Christ will come. The two witnesses will come. And there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. You know, Rome's going to bring back the temple treasures. That is a fact. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord hath spoken it. It's going to happen pretty rapidly, friends. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess, this, uh, possess Gilead. Do you not see that God is actually prophesying of the West Bank and the Palestinians, the Philistines, that they're going to get these areas? And the captive of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto uh, Zarephath. And the captive of Jerusalem, which is in uh, Sephar, shall possess the cities of the south. Hmm. That's interesting. Everything prophetically laid out. The captivity of Jerusalem. Because why? Rome is going to take it captive and make it a city of all nations. But there's going to be a little south section of the city that they're going to be allowed to live in. And the saviors shall come up out of Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now God actually speaks about when he will bring Esau to an end. In another scripture here, and he says, when the whole earth rejoices, you will come to an end. And there's only one place when the whole earth will rejoice, biblically speaking. And that is when the two witnesses are killed in Revelation 11. And the Bible says when their dead bodies lay in the street, the whole earth will rejoice and send gifts one to another. And God says when the whole earth rejoices, he will bring Esau to naught. The Vatican will burn to the ground. And one day, according to Revelation, she has come to nothing. I'm Stephen Bendenoon. The Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Pray for us here. We desperately need your prayers. We need your help as well. Um, we have a lot of financial obligation to meet. And we do need your help in that. Just ask you to remember us in your prayers and those things there. Also, if you would, uh, remember Sister Lisa in prayer. She is our prayer warrior partner. She is very sick with the flu, as well as... Uh, her children, uh, her daughter Laura, her grandson Noah, and her daughter is going to be having a baby, so it's not good that she's in that condition, and as well as her son-in-law. So I ask that you be in prayer for them as well, as we will be in prayer for them, that God will give them a speedy recovery, and that they will feel better soon. God bless you all. We love you and bless you in the name of every name of the Nile Shohamashiach, Lord Jesus Christ.